So welcome to something a little bit different. And I think with it being winter, at least in North America and Europe right now, um, I thought I would explain a couple of things that I probably over-engineered like I do most things. So there's many things I miss from living in Europe. And one of them is the Christmas markets. And for us North Americans, we don't really have the same high density city centers that like ban cars with cobblestone walkways. They're exceedingly common in especially Italy, but a lot of other countries. We notice them in Germany and Switzerland and a few others as well. Um, in those Christmas markets, they usually have uh, local meats and cheese, salamis, um, prosciutto, all sorts of things. They have uh, toys and general gifts, chocolates, uh, freshly roasted chestnuts, something I've never seen in Canada quite amazing um, and you know there's there's such a emphasis on quality and one of the things that I thoroughly enjoyed being a chocolate lover was the hot chocolate and they have these machines that constantly has to churn in order to keep it from kind of gooping together and solidifying because it's so thick and rich and I absolutely loved it and I'd look for ways of replicating it while I was there. Um, and the best I came up with, uh, my Italian colleagues kept recommending a brand of little mix called Chico Bar. And I could never get it to thicken up as it should have. I was always doing something wrong. However, this res Restora, uh, Restora, I think, I could make that work and it was close. It wasn't as authentic. It wasn't as, um, you know, truly rich, but it was close, I felt. And if you look up most simple hot chocolate recipes, you know, your winter time, the best ones will usually be start with milk in a pot, sugar, cocoa. Some of them get exotic with like um, using real chocolates and, and um, cocoa butter and stuff like that. But what I found was really, really interesting and quite simple was, how do you thicken it? Um, there's a couple of natural ways of thickening it, but I'm not one of those um, fancier people. So I've actually left a link down below to a much higher end exotic if, um, recipe. So if you're looking for a, a top quality recipe, check that out. Um, but if you just kind of like me, your average Joe, overweight cyclist, um, and miss a few things from, from Europe, all you're going to need is some quality cocoa. Um, I surprisingly, this local co-op brand is the only one that doesn't seem to have a filler in it. Um, some granulated sugar and some cornstarch acts as a thickening agent. And that's exactly what is in this. Maybe a little tiny bit of salt, they have a stabilizer for the cocoa, but this is all you need. So what you need to get together is for about 125 to 175 milliliters, depending on how strong you want it, I went about reverse engineering this. And how did I do that? Well, I set up a factorial experiment for two factors. I held the sugar constant and I adjusted cocoa and cornstarch. And to try and see if there's any factor interactions, you have to do a combination of highs and lows for each one. So that's what I did. And I've backed out what I think is a good mixture, which is one tablespoon of cocoa, one tablespoon of granulated sugar, two teaspoons of cornstarch. And that will give sufficient thickness and sweetness and cocoa flavor I found. Now, obviously, any of these recipes are to taste. I tend to um, water it or put a little extra milk to try and decrease the amount of sugar in it, maybe compensate with a little bit of cocoa, but that kind of matched up as closely as possible to this guy over here. So this is what the powder should look like after it's been mixed together. First, 
one tablespoon cocoa. You want it kind of loose, put that aside here. Now, just regular granulated sugar. So I'm using a half teaspoon measure, so one ta or half tablespoon, so one tablespoon and two loosely packed scoops of cornstarch. All right. So in order to get to this, you just want to keep mixing it. You want to make sure that your granulated sugar is as mixed in as possible. You're not seeing any white specks. So we can see a lot of white specks here and so you have to just keep mixing it around. Um, if you have a small whisk, that may be better. But uh, I mean, if you're some cyclist like me who doesn't know what they're doing in the kitchen, well, dessert fork, so. See, very well mixed. So we've got two of those. Um, now all we're going to need to do is measure out 125, maybe 150 milliliters of milk. And we're gonna put that in, dump in some of one of these powders, and then we're going to consistently stir. No heat right now. Just want about half, a, a little more than half a cup. There we are, pour that in. And just get all that out. Um, any little humidity, it likes to cling to things. That should be good. High heat. And this is where things get really critical. Continuous mixing. At first, it's going to look like it's not mixing. But eventually, it will mix in. It's going to remain liquidy and then should start thickening after everything has been mixed thoroughly, but it should not reach a boil. You'll usually feel at the bottom things, uh, some thickness forming. And we're actually at that stage right now. So this is critical to keep moving, reduce the heat, turn it off. Now that you've built a reasonable facsimile of an Italian hot chocolate, at least a mediocre one, unless you watch the other videos linked below, then what am I still doing here? Well, of course, I'm going to be critical of things. I'm going to be critical of the colloquial sayings of, oh, cooking is chemistry. Lots and lots of people say these things, but no one will ever go on about how they have to balance their their carbons and their hydrogens and their redox reactions during baking a cake, which is unfortunate. I would have really enjoyed that. Um, and no one really talks about how they're doing Taylor and McLaurin expansion series in order to approximate various instruments and see how the, the sine waves should overlap on each other in an approximate fashion. Yeah, that one is a little less interesting to me. Um, but, what they mean is that there's, there are reactions at play and they're not simple to predict. And, you know, grade six, we, we're, we're taught the scientific method. And then if you're lucky enough to beat your heads on a master's degree, um, then what you'll usually find out in engineering, at least in some of the better... Um, if you have a better course availability, something called experimental design. 
and I thoroughly enjoyed my experimental design course so many years ago. Um, uh, it's, it's formed the basis of so many things that I do, and it's formed the basis of several of the patents that my name is on. So, it's, it's just this wonderful experience of getting to go into a classroom and a teacher will ask of, you know, these people who have engineering degrees, sometimes industry professionals, and say, how do they do an experiment? And, you know, they'll one by one, some people there were people in the class from nationally funded research laboratories and they will immediately describe how they do the experiment and the prof gets to say, no, you're wrong. That's a waste of millions and millions of dollars. And yes, that does happen. It is glorious. It is so glorious to see. The reason it's fun to see is because we're all going to learn a little bit more. So, what is that failed method? What is that method that someone experienced in factorial design or design of experiments doesn't like? It's called, or it's abbreviated as OFAT, one factor at a time. And OFAT is generally just wrong, and there is almost no excuse for it at all anymore. Um, it's really tough to excuse an OFAT experiment now. So, start it with low, and then we have three factors, sugar, cocoa, cornstarch, and go high on the sugar while holding everything else low, high on the cocoa, high on the cornstarch. Everything else has to be low. And that generates, if you were to math it in three dimensions, you just see this. Ignore the cube for now, because we'll get to that. But that essentially is, if you can get a numeric value out of your results, you get a regression, something like this, and say that these were how much you liked the hot chocolate on zero to 10. Oh, it's sweet enough, but there's no sh chocolate and no thickness. It's chocolatey, but it's bitter. There's no sweetness. There's no thickness. Oh, it's thick like horrible gravy, but yeah. It's not hot chocolate. So then you, you do a regression. Essentially, you want everything to be 10, and you know you, you say, all right, to ramp this up, everything needs to be high, 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 and then you do that, and you're like, oh god, this is chalky and gross. It's so gross. <laughs> and a lot of responses are like this. So to get across why something like that might happen, let's assume for an instance that the cocoa and the cornstarch kind of cause a chalky texture, and that people's response to this is nonlinear. So, for any one given instance in our range, say we have a unit of, we'll just call it one for now, you square one, you get one. No big deal. And that falls into barely the acceptable range. You go too far out of that, you say doubled the amount of cocoa, you would be in this range and it would be to the four. If you tripled it, it would be, you know, nine. So by here, you're like, oh God, I'm just, I'm just chewing on pieces of chalk. Well, each of these things may have that response, but even though you're operating in this range, it's like you're jumping outside that range. So the cocoa and the cornstarch could have an interaction. So we need a better model. So if we could look at every sing single thing individually, sugar, cocoa, cornstarch, and then every interaction, sugar and cocoa, sugar and cornstarch, cocoa and cornstarch, sugar, cocoa, and cornstarch. We have seven terms. Well, how do you regress seven terms? You need at least eight experiments. Oh, well, this is starting to seem a bit obvious now, because if we have a high and low of everything, if we, and we have three different factors, that's two to the power of three, eight, eight experiments. And that's what we've got here. If we keep everything low, just like we did over here, sugar high, everything else low. And then you'll see that this is the same, but then this is the first one we get something different. We have a high amount of sugar and a high amount of cocoa. And if you go through all of these, you'll actually see that every possible combination is there. 
I won't talk about some of the nonlinear stuff you can do when you expand this, checking for nonlinearities. Um, it, it, it can get really, really deep. This is a very low level example. But this is basically what I did. So it was able to tune an amount of sugar, tune an amount of cocoa, and tune an amount of cornstarch. And really my range has probably needed a little bit of adjustment, but I was quite happy to fully go up here, fully go over here, and part way. I only got part way through the cornstarch. And that's important. I couldn't do that with this. I mean, I'm sure I could have went, well, there's something wrong here, and, and just try a randomly adjusting something, adjust something up and down. And I might get it on the next experiment, so it'll be six to get a plus one for that the optimal optimal one or it could have taken me seven or ten tries and that's what most people most cooks do from what i've been able to gather is they get an idea they work on it oh it's a bit too much of this it's a bit too much of this and they they just try and like weave around trying it over and over and over until they've optimized their experience whereas Something like this, you just go, oh yeah, no, through the optimal of this, you get a response curve like this. The, the peak is here. Therefore, these are your optimal ingredients. You run a trial there. Most of the time you're right and it's done. So cooking is a bit more engineering for me than just calling it science and hoping everyone else shuts up about it. So if you want more information about this, look into design of experiments. Um, I think the book I have is by Montgomery. Uh, it's a really simple, it's easy to follow book. Each chapter just builds on the last. Uh, and it's, it's actually really easy to learn a lot of this stuff. Um, with that, this is probably my last video for the year. Uh, hopefully next year I'll be back to some bike and experimental stuff, but keep in mind, this is the basis for a lot of the stuff I do. So um, with that, happy holidays. Uh, you know, if you like the content, feel free to subscribe. I, I'd love more subscribers, more followers, more feedback, and generally just happy holidays. Enjoy the winter.